those and I am just about to start um, number 335, the white and blue mandala special shape diamond painting that I got from Fan Cells. Um, and it came up in the penny pick just a few minutes ago. So uh, I'm going to start it. And uh, I, when I did the unboxing, I uh, showed you this tool, which is the Marvi Uchida Jewel Picker, which I found on Amazon. And it looks like it's um, just what you need to pick up odd shaped gems. So I will be using this. Uh, there are two versions of this. This one here, uh, I bought it on Amazon.ca. Uh, it was about $3.38 or something like that, um, Canadian, which is, I don't know, two fifty dollars or something, U.S. Uh, and it has a, a large, well, it's not that large, but it's, it's larger than um, the red tip. Uh, it has what they call a large tip on it. And there's another one that they sell as well that's got another tip on it which is a small tip, which would be great for little teeny tiny rhinestone gems, like, you know, those little teeny tiny um, tear-shaped gems that are so tiny that, you know, they're hard to, they're hard to place. Anyway, um, that one cost about $12 and some odd cents a Canadian, which is, I don't know, nine or $10 uh, American. And I didn't want to spend that much money until I knew whether I liked the tool at all. So I'm going to be using this for the special shape gems on this diamond painting. And um, I don't know if I want to... Usually I start with the regular... Usually I start with the regular rhinestones. And so I think that's what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to set this aside in my, um, I've got my sort of tray here that I keep the diamond, the drills that I'll be using most frequently in. Um, so I will use this for um, the specials, but I'll just use a regular drill pen for my uh, regular crystal drills. So today I will be reading the end of the book Replay by Ken Grimwood. And um, I'll do the entire diamond painting in regular time without sound. And I'll overlay the sound of the uh, of me reading the book. And But I will um, speed this up to be exactly the same length as the audio recording. So you'll be able to see this from start to finish. Okay. So with that, I'm going to get into the video. Well, hello everybody. It's Rose. And today we're here to finish reading the book Replay by Ken Grimwood. If you have not listened to the previous chapters yet, I will include up in the top right hand corner, in the little eye, a link to the playlist for this book. And you can catch up on all the other chapters. And if you are not yet a subscriber, I would ask that you take a moment right now to click on the little subscribe link in the bottom right hand corner. And if you just love my channel and you like all the types of videos that I make, or you want me to make more of a specific kind of video, why don't you consider becoming a patron? You can find all the information about how to subscribe to my Patreon account in the description to this video down below. And there will also be a link at the end of this video. So let's start reading chapter 19. The Blue Jay darting and flitting outside the kitchen window as it built its nest in the backyard elm tree, was the first thing Pamela saw. She watched the bird's colorful aerial dance, 
took several long, deep breaths to calm herself before she looked around or moved. She was in the process of making a cup of coffee, had been just about to insert the filter at the machine. The kitchen was cozy, familiar, different than it had been last time, but she remembered it well from her first life, before the replaying had begun. Last replay, she hadn't spent much time in here, had been too busy in her studio, painting and sculpting. The room had taken on the character of the maid they'd hired more than of herself. This kitchen now bore the stamp of her own personality, or at least the personality she'd had the first time around. There was a Barbara Cartland novel lying open on the table, and next to it a copy of Better Homes and Gardens. Various clippings and notes to herself were stuck to the refrigerator door with little magnets shaped and painted like tiny ears of corn or stalks of celery. A drawing she'd done of the children, well executed, but without the finer skills of lighting and composition she'd acquired through years of practice in other lives, was taped to one of the cabinets. A large kitchen calendar hung above the table. It was open to March 1984, and the dates were neatly crossed off to the end of the month. Pamela was 34. Her daughter, Kimberly, would have just turned eight. Christopher would be 11. She set the coffee filter aside, started to leave the kitchen, but then stopped and smiled as she recalled something. She opened one of the lower drawers beneath the counter rummaged behind the boxes of flour and rice. And sure enough, there it was, right where she'd always kept it hidden. A Ziploc plastic bag containing most of an ounce of grass and a packet of easy wider rolling papers. Her lone vice in those days, her one real escape from the tedium of housework and parenting, as it had come to be called. Pamela put the marijuana back where she found it, walked into the living room. The family photographs were hung there, along with two of her paintings from college. The promise that they showed had never been developed in this lifetime. Why had she ever let her talent go to waste for so long? She could hear muffled music from upstairs, Cindy Lauper's cartoonishly bouncy voice singing, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Kimberly must be home from school. Christopher would probably be in his own room, playing with the Apple II computer that they would bought him that Christmas. She sat on the chair in the foyer, took a pencil and a pad of paper from the telephone table, and dialed information for New York City. There was no listing for a Jeff or Jeffrey Winston in Manhattan or Queens. No Linda or L. Winston either. It had been a long shot anyway. There was no reason to think he might be back in New York. Pamela tried information again, this time in Orlando. His parents were listed. She called and Jeff's mother answered the phone. Hello. Hello. My name is Pamela Phillips, and, oh my goodness, Jeff told us you'd be trying to get in touch with him, but Lord, that was ages ago, three years ago, I think, or maybe four. The woman's voice faded as she apparently turned away from the mouthpiece, called in an aside, honey, it's that Phillips girl that Jeff said might call, remember? Could you find me that envelope he sent? She came back to the phone. Pamela, hold on just a minute, dear. There's a message for you here from Jeff. My husband's getting it. Thank you. Could you tell me where Jeff is, where he's living now? He's out in California in a little town. Well, right outside it, he says, called Montgomery Creek, up close to Oregon. Yes, Pamela said, I know where it is. He said you would. You know, he doesn't even have a phone out there. Can you imagine? It worries me sick, thinking what could happen in an emergency. But he says he's got a shortwave radio for that kind of thing. I just don't know what came over him. A grown man quitting his job and leaving his wife and... 
Oh, I'm sorry. I hope I wasn't speaking out of turn to... It's quite all right, Mrs. Winston, honestly. Well, it was just the strangest thing anyhow. You might expect that kind of foolishness from a college boy, but for a man his age, he'll be 40 before too very long, you know. Oh, thank you, honey. Pamela, I've got that envelope he sent us for when you called. He said we ought to just open it and read it to you. Do you want to get a pencil or something? I'm all set. Okay, then let me see. Hmm. You'd think after all this time and so much mystery, there'd be more to it than this. What does it say? It's just one line. It says, if you're coming, be sure to bring the children. I love you, Jeff. That's all there is to it. Did you get that? Do you want me to read it again? No, Pamela said, a grin spreading wide on her suddenly flushed face. Thank you so much, but I understood it perfectly. She set the phone down, looked toward the staircase. Christopher and Kimberly were old enough now. They wouldn't like the idea of leaving home at first, but she knew they'd soon grow to love Montgomery Creek and Jeff. Besides, Pamela thought, biting her lip, it wouldn't be for long. They'd be back here in New Rochelle, back with their father, before they started high school. Three and a half years, her final replay, the last months and days of her phenomenally protracted life. She planned to enjoy them all to the fullest. It was one of those rains that will neither cease nor get on with it and be done, but simply keeps on falling with a dull, intermittent insistence. They'd been stuck inside the cabin like this for two days now. It was getting musty. The air dank with the smell of mildew from a leather vest that Christopher had left hanging on the porch railing overnight and had brought inside the next morning to dry by the stove. Kimberly, Pamela said with exasperated dismay, will you please stop drumming on that plate? She can't hear you, Christopher said, and leaned across the table to lift the miniature foam headphone away from his sister's left ear. Mom says to cut it out, he yelled over the titty sounds of Madonna's like a virgin. As a matter of fact, just turn that off, Pamela said. It's rude to listen to music by yourself while we're all having lunch. The girl put on her most aggrieved grimace and pout, but took the headphones off and put the Walkman away, as she'd been told. I want another glass of milk, she said in a petulant tone. We're out of milk, Jeff reminded her. I'm going into town tomorrow morning. I'll bring some back then. You can ride in with me if you'd like. It may have stopped raining, and we could walk down by the falls. I've already seen the falls, Kimberly whined. I want to watch MTV. Jeff smiled tolerantly. Out of luck there, kiddo, he said. We could listen to the shortwave, though, see what they're saying in China or Africa. I don't care about China or Africa. I'm bored. Why don't we just talk then, Pamela suggested. That's what people used to do, you know. Yeah, sure, Christopher muttered. What did they ever find to talk about so much? Sometimes they told each other stories, Jeff put in. That's an idea, Pamela said, brightening. Would you like to tell me a story? Oh, geez, Mom, come on, Christopher protested. What do you think we are, in kindergarten or something? I don't know, Kimberly said, turning thoughtful. Maybe it would be fun to hear a story. We haven't done that in a long time. You willing to at least give it a try? Pamela asked her son. He shrugged didn't answer. Well, she began, thousands and thousands of years ago, there was a dolphin named Cetacea. One day, a strange new awareness suddenly came into her head, as if it had come from the sky above her ocean and beyond. Now, this was in the days when dolphins and people sometimes spoke to one another, but, and with the gentle summer rain in the background, she told them the story of Starcy, of the common bond of loving hope that linked the intelligent creatures of the earth, the sea, the stars, and of the catastrophic loss that ultimately brought humanity to the sorrowfully exalted moment 
of first full contact with its ocean kin. The children fidgeted a bit at first, but as the tale wore on, they listened with increasing fascination while their mother verbally recreated the film that had once won her worldwide acclaim and had brought her together with Jeff. When she had finished, Kimberly was weeping openly, but with the glow of otherworldly rapture in her young eyes. Christopher had turned his face away to the window and didn't speak for a long time. Just before dusk, a single shaft of sunlight broke through the overcast sky, and Jeff and Pamela stood outside on the porch to watch it slowly fade. The children chose to stay inside. Kimberly had borrowed some of Pamela's watercolors and was painting images of stars and dolphins, while Christopher was absorbed in one of John Lilly's books. The shifting light played vividly across the rain-soaked meadow, the billion droplets beaded on the fresh-cut grass shimmering like unearthly jewels in a field of green fire. Jeff stood quietly behind Pamela, his arms around her waist, her hair against his cheek. Just before the light failed, he whispered something in her ear, a line from Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand, he murmured, and a heaven in a wild flower. She pressed her hands to his, softly completed the quote. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, she said, and eternity in an hour. The tow plane taxied into position, and when it had come to a stop, engine still turning, the line boy ran out to attach the 200-foot nylon rope from the sailplane to the hook at the tail of the idling Cessna up ahead. Christopher, you want to check out the controls for me? Jeff said it to the boy who sat in the student's seat in front of him. Sure thing, Pamela's son answered, his tone serious with pride at being part of the preparations, not just someone who was along for the ride. The boy wiggled the glider stick left and right, and the ailerons at each wingtip responded. Then he pushed back and forth on the stick, and Jeff turned back to see the elevator at the tail of the craft flap up and down, as it should, followed by the shimmy of the rudder as Christopher moved his feet on the pedals. All the controls seemed to be in good working order, and Jeff smiled his approval. The tow plane ahead of them began to inch forward, slowly taking up the slack in the rope. Its rudder waggled the pilot's ready query, and Jeff answered with a matching right and left movement of his own rudder. The Cessna moved down the runway, pulling the sailplane behind it. The wing boy ran alongside, holding the craft level and keeping it headed into the wind. Jeff kept his eyes on the tow plane, judging the level of his wings by the horizon line ahead. They picked up speed, the ground crew boy dropped back, and Jeff eased back slightly on the stick. They were airborne. Out of the corner of his eye, Jeff noted low swirls of puffy white clouds near the base of the mountain ahead. Good sign. That meant unstable moist air and thermals already developing. No time to look for them now, though. He stared intently at the tow plane and the line kept the nylon rope rigidly straight, and turned smoothly as the Cessna turned. They reached altitude, 3,000 feet above the lower slopes of the mountain. Jeff pulled the release knob, waited a moment to see the undone tow line snap forward like a rubber band, then went into a climbing turn to the right as the tow plate veered off and downward to the left. The Cessna's engine faded away as it returned to the little airport they'd left, and soon there was no sound at all but the smooth rushing of the air against the plexiglass canopy. They were in steady, powerless flight. God, Jeff, this is great! Jeff smiled, nodded as Christopher turned in his seat to look back at him, the boy's eyes wide and gleaming. He held the sailplane in a long, looping turn, using the leftover energy of their tow speed to gain as much working altitude as possible. 
The unearthly white cone of Mount Shasta slid by on their left, then reappeared in front of them, a sun bright beacon urging them ever upward. Jeff looked back toward the southwest, where the town named after the mountain lay nestled in the great surrounding forest of ponderosa pines. A single legend Cessna, towing another white and blue sailplane, was approaching. Jeff circled lazily, his speed beginning to drop to the normal cruising range of 40 to 50 miles per hour as he waited for the other craft to join him. When it was a mile or so away, the second glider broke free of its umbilical and swept up and away from the powered tug in a maneuver exactly like the one Jeff had just performed. Christopher pressed his face to the side of the clear canopy, watching the new arrival as it swooped toward them and drew alongside in smooth formation. Pamela smiled and gave a thumbs up from the rear control seat of the other sailplane, and in the front seat, Kimberly beamed ecstatically, waving at Jeff and her brother. Jeff gently touched his left rudder pedal as he banked the wings leftward with the stick, breaking the loop they were in and turning toward the great symmetrical bulk of the mountain. Pamela followed suit, staying just behind and to the right of him. The snowy treetops on the mountainside seemed to reach for them as they drew nearer, and the angle of the slopes beneath them steepened. A lone deer chanced to look up and gave a startled shiver, then stood transfixed, staring at the great soundless birds not far above. Farther on, a quarter of the way around the mountain, Christopher pointed excitedly at a lumbering black bear, oblivious to the strange metal creatures sweeping low through the sky. They found a bit of ridge lift, a swirling updraft of reflected wind in front of and above the crest of a jutting cliff on the more rugged backside of the mountain. Jeff and Pamela glided along the ridge for several minutes, back and forth, looking at the silent, untouched snow that seemed so close they might have reached out to scoop up a powdery handful. Then Jeff spotted a thin wisp of cloud just forming against the blue sky slightly east of the mountain. He broke formation headed for the newborn puff of condensation. As he reached it, his right wing tip lifted slightly and he immediately veered in that direction. When he did, the whole plane began to lift and he slowed into a tight, controlled turn. The sailplane rose dramatically, kept on rising. Below him, it was clear that Pamela saw what he had found. She turned abruptly away from the gentle upcurrents off the cliff, headed in his direction. Her glider seemed to diminish in size with every second, as Jeff and Christopher rode the lifting mass of air higher and higher, locked into a steeply banked turn to stay within the narrow confines of the thermal's center. Pamela flew in looping circles downwind of his position, searching. At last, she caught the nebulous warm updraft, and the distance between them closed as her plane lifted swiftly and silently towards his. Until, wingtip to wingtip, they soared together in the crisp, clean skies above Mount Shasta's ageless and enigmatic peak. Kimberly had stopped crying, was outside picking a bunch of September wildflowers to take with her on her trip east. Christopher was being a man about it. He was 15, after all, and had long since begun to emulate Jeff's attitudes of acceptance in the face of adversity and unrestrained joy where joy, as it so frequently had these past few years, became appropriate. My hiking boots won't fit in the suitcase, Mum. You won't really need them in New Rochelle, honey, Pamela said. I guess not, except maybe if Dad takes us up camping in the Berkshires like he said he would. I could wear them then. How about if I sent them to you? Well, you don't have to do that. It's okay. We'll be back before Christmas anyway, and I just have to mail them back here again. 
Pamela nodded, turned her head away so her son wouldn't see her eyes. I know you'd like to have them with you, Jeff put in. Why don't we go ahead and send them along and we'll get you another pair to keep here. We could do that with all your stuff, if you'd like. Hey, that'd be great, Christopher exclaimed with a grin. It makes sense, Jeff said. Sure, if I'm gonna be spending half the year with Dad and the other half here with you and Mum, you sure that'd be okay? Mum, is that all right with you? It sounds like a very good idea, Pamela said, forcing a smile. Why don't you go make a list of all the things you'd like us to send? Okay, Christopher said, heading toward the two-bedroom annex Jeff had built onto the cabin for the boy and his sister. Then he stopped and turned. Can I tell Kimberly? I bet there's a lot of things she'd like to have back east, too. Of course, Pamela told him. But don't you two take too long about it. We have to leave for Reading in an hour, or you'll miss your flight. We'll hurry, Mum, he said, running outside to fetch his sister. Pamela turned to Jeff, let flow the tears she'd been holding back. I don't want them to go. It's still another month before, before he embraced her, smoothed her hair. We've been through all this before, he told her gently. It's best for them to have a few weeks to adjust to being with their father again, to make new friends. That may help them absorb the shock a little. Jeff, she said, sobbing, I'm scared. I don't want to die, not die forever. And he hugged her tightly, rocked her in his arms, and felt his own tears trickle down his face. Just think of how we've lived. Think of all we've done. And let's try to be grateful for that. But we could have done so much more. We could have... Hush, he whispered. We did all we could. More than either of us ever dreamed when we were first starting out. She leaned back, searched his eyes as if seeing them for the first time or the last. I know, she sighed. It's just... I got so used to the endless possibilities, the time, never being bound by our mistakes, always knowing we could go back and change things, make them better. But we didn't, did we? We only made things different. A voice droned on interminably in the dim background of Jeff's consciousness. It didn't matter who the voice belonged to or what it might be saying. Pamela was dead, never to return. The realization washed over him like seawater against an open wound, filled his mind with an all-encompassing grief he had not felt since the loss of his daughter Gretchen. He clenched his fists, lowered his head beneath the weight of the undeniable, the intolerable, and still the voice babbled forth its senseless litany. See if Charlie could get react from Mayor Koch on Reagan's Bitburg trip. Looks like this one could really whip up into a firestorm. We've got the American Legion coming down on him about it, and Congress is starting to buzz. That's, Jeff, you okay? Yeah, he said, glancing up briefly. I'm fine, go ahead. He was in the conference room of WFYI in New York, the all-news radio station where he'd been news director when first he died. He was seated at one end of a long oval table. The morning and midday editors were on either side of him, and the reporters occupied the other chairs. He hadn't seen these people for decades, but Jeff recognized the place, the situation, instantly. He'd had the same meeting every weekday morning for years, the daily assignment conference, where the structure of the day's news coverage was planned as best it could be in advance. Gene Collins, the ongoing midday editor, was frowning at him with concern. You sure you're feeling all right? We could cut this short. There's not much else to discuss. 
Just go ahead, Jean. I'll be fine. Well, okay. Anyway, that's about it for Metro Stories and local angles. On the national front, we've got the shuttle going up this morning. And which one? Jeff rasped out. What? Jean asked, puzzled. Which shuttle? Discovery. You know, the one with the senator on board? Thank God for that at least. So immediately after Pamela's final death, Jeff wasn't sure he could have handled a repeat of the chaos and depression in the newsroom on the day of the Challenger disaster. He should have known better anyway, if he'd been thinking clearly. Reagan had gone to Bitburg in the spring of 1985. That would make this sometime around April of that year, nine or ten months before the shuttle would explode. Everyone at the table was looking at him strangely, wondering why he seemed so distraught, so disoriented. To hell with it. Let them think whatever they wanted. Let's wrap it up. All right, Jean? The editor nodded, began gathering the scattered papers he had brought to the meeting. Only other good story developing is the rape recant thing in Illinois. Dotson's going back to prison today while his lawyer prepares an appeal. That's it. Questions, anybody? The school board meeting looks like it might run long today, one of the reporters said. I don't know if I'll be able to make this 2 p.m. fire department awards thing. You want me to dump out of the school board early, or would you rather put somebody else on the awards? Jeff? Collins asked, deferring to him. I don't care. You decide. Jean frowned again, started to say something, but didn't. He turned back to the reporters who had begun to mumble among themselves. Bill, stick with the school board as long as you need to. Charlie, you hit the fire department ceremony after you talk to the mayor. Give us a live shot on Koch and Bitburg at one. Then you can hold off filing until after the awards are over. Oh, and Jim, Mobile 4 is in the shop. You'll be taking Mobile 7. The meeting broke up quietly, with none of the usual wisecracks and raucous laughter. The reporters and the off-going early morning editor filed out of the conference room, casting quick, covert glances at Jeff. Gene Collins hung behind, stacking and restacking his sheaf of papers. You want to talk about it? he finally said. Jeff shook his head. Nothing to talk about. I told you. I'll be all right. Look, if it's a problem with Linda, I mean, I understand. You know what a rough go of it Carol and I had a couple of years ago. You helped me through a lot of that. God knows, I bet your ear enough. So anytime you want to sit down over a beer, just let me know. Thanks, Jean. I appreciate your concern, I really do, but it's something I have to work out for myself. Collins shrugged, stood from the table. That's up to you, he said, but if you ever do feel like unloading your problems, feel free to dump a few in my direction. I owe you. Jeff nodded briefly. Then Collins left the room, and he was alone again. Chapter 20. Jeff quit work, made enough bets and short-term yield investments to enable Linda to get by on her own for the next three years. There was no time to build a major inheritance for her. He increased his life insurance coverage tenfold and let it go at that. He moved into a small apartment on the Upper West Side, spent his days and evenings wandering the streets of Manhattan taking in all the sights and smells and sounds of humanity from which he had so long isolated himself. The old people fascinated him the most, their eyes full of distant memories and lost hope, their bodies slumped in anticipation of the end of time. Now that Pamela was gone, the fears and regrets she had expressed came back to trouble him as deeply as they disturbed her toward the end. He'd done what he could to reassure her, to ease the grief and terror of her final days, but she'd been right. For all that they had struggled, all they'd once achieved, 
the end result was null. Even the happiness they had managed to find together had been frustratingly brief. A few years stolen here and there, transient moments of love and contentment like vanishing specks of foam in a sea of lonely, needless separation. It had seemed as if they would have forever an infinity of choices and second chances. They had squandered far too much of the priceless time that had been granted them, wasted it on bitterness and guilt and futile quests for non-existent answers, when they themselves, their love for each other, had been all the answer either of them should have ever needed. Now, even the opportunity to tell her that to hold her in his arms and let her know how much he had revered and cherished her was eternally denied him. Pamela was dead, and in three years' time, Jeff, too, would die, never knowing why he'd lived. He roamed his city streets, watching, listening. Tough-eyed bands of punks, furious at the world. Men and women in corporate attire, hurrying to accomplish whatever goals they had established for themselves giggling swarms of children, exuberant at the newness of their lives. Jeff envied them all, coveted their innocence, their ignorance, their expectations. Several weeks after he'd quit his job at WFYI, he got a call from one of the news writers who worked there, a woman, girl really, named Lydia Randell. Everyone at the station was concerned about him, she said had been shocked when he resigned and worried further when they'd heard his marriage had broken up. Jeff told her, as he had told Jean Collins, that he was all right. But she pressed the issue, insisted he meet her for a drink so she could talk to him in person. They met the next afternoon at the sign of the Dove on 3rd Avenue at 65th, took a table by one of the windows that was open to a gloriously sunny New York June. Lydia was wearing a shoulder-bearing white cotton dress and a matching wide-brimmed hat from which a pink satin ribbon trailed. She was an exceptionally pretty young woman, with a mass of wavy blonde hair and wide, liquid green eyes. Jeff recited the story he concocted to explain his sudden retirement, a standard tale of journalist burnout combined with some half-truths about the recent luck he'd had with his investments. Lydia nodded understandingly, seemed to accept his explanations at face value. As far as his marriage went, he told her it had effectively been over for a long time, no specific problems worth belaboring, just a case of two people who had gradually grown apart. Lydia listened solicitously. She had another drink, then began to talk about her own life. She was 23 had come to New York right after she graduated from the University of Illinois, was living with the boyfriend she had met in college. He, his name was Matthew, was eager to get married, but she was no longer so sure. She felt trapped, needed space, wanted to meet new friends and have all the adventurous experiences she'd missed growing up in a small town in the Midwest. She and Matthew were no longer the same people they used to be. Lydia said. She felt she had outgrown him. Jeff let her talk it out, all the commonplace woes and longings of youth that to her were freshly overwhelming and of unprecedented import in her life. She hadn't the perspective to recognize how utterly ordinary her story was, though perhaps she did have some glimmering of that awareness, since she had at least expressed her urgent desire to break free of the cliché her life had become. He commiserated, talked with her for an hour or more about her life and love and independence, told her she had to make her own decisions, said she had to learn to take risks, said all the obvious and necessary things that one must say to someone who was facing a universal human crisis for the first time in her life. A gusting breeze from the open window stirred her hair, wafted the ribbon from her hat against her face. Lydia brushed it away, and Jeff found something inexplicably touching about the gesture, the girlish way her hand had moved. In her prettily animated face, 
he suddenly saw a reflection of Judy Gordon and of Linda on that day she brought him the daisies. Bright promise and unshaped dreams of morning. They finished their drinks and he saw her to a taxi. As she got into the cab, she looked up at him and said, with all the optimism and presumed infinity of youth, I guess it'll be okay. I mean, we've got plenty of time to work it out. We have so much time. Jeff knew that illusion far too well. He gave the young woman a half-hearted smile, shook her hand, and watched her ride away toward her life, her long pink ribbon blowing free. The Metro North commuter train pulled to a stop precisely on time, Jeff noted from his vantage point a hundred feet farther down the platform. At this time of day, it was something of a misnomer to call it a commuter train, he thought. Not many businessmen would have taken the 11 a.m. run into the city. Jeff began walking briskly toward the ramp to the terminal, as if he'd gotten off a different line. He slowed his pace a bit as he passed the train from New Rochelle and saw that he'd been right. There were a number of women dressed for shopping trips, a smattering of college students, but almost no one with a suit and tie and briefcase among the disembarking passengers. She was one of the last to leave the train. He almost missed her and had begun to worry that the information he'd been given might be incorrect. She was nicely dressed, but without the fanatical attention to detail that marked the women headed for Bendel's or Bergdorf's. Her low-heeled shoes were designed for walking, and her pale blue linen dress and light wool sweater had an appealing air of practicality about them. Jeff fell into step twenty or thirty paces behind her as she walked up the ramp and into Grand Central's huge main concourse. He was afraid he might lose her in the crowd, but her height and distinctive straight blonde hair helped him keep her in view as they weaved their separate ways toward the swarms of people. She went up the broad stairs that led to the Pan Am building, and Jeff dropped back a bit as he followed her through the less crowded lobby and out onto East 45th Street. She strode across Park Avenue, past the Roosevelt Hotel, and across Madison to 5th, where she turned north. The window displays at Saxe and Cartier caused her only the briefest of pauses, during which Jeff slowed to feign interest in a Korean Airlines package tour or the matched sets of Mark Cross luggage. She turned west again at 53rd Street and entered the Museum of Modern Art. The detective agency Jeff had hired six weeks ago was right, at least as far as today went. Every other Thursday, they told him, Pamela Phillips Robeson took a train into Manhattan for an afternoon of visiting galleries and museums. He paid his admission fee and noticed as he went through the turnstile that his palms were damp with perspiration. Now he had lost track of her for the moment. Jeff still wasn't sure why he'd gone to such lengths to arrange to see her, if only from a distance. He was fully aware that this woman was not the Pamela he had known and loved, and that she never would be. Her replays had reached their end. He could never hope for that sudden look of awareness and intimate recognition he'd seen on her face that night in the college bar when she'd understood who she was, who he was, who and what they'd been together over the decades. No, this version of Pamela would remain forever ignorant of all that. Yet he longed to look once more into her eyes, perhaps even to briefly hear her voice. The temptation had finally proven irresistible, and he felt no shame for harboring that desire, no guilt for having followed her. Jeff looked for her in the museum shop off the lobby first. On the unlikely chance, she might have stopped in, only to purchase a book or a poster. But Pamela wasn't among the browsers. He walked back through the lobby, into the glass-walled garden hall, and over to the first floor galleries before coming back to take the escalators to the upper levels. There were two main exhibits underway, 
in addition to the familiar displays from the permanent collection. One was a show in commemoration of Mies van der Rohe's centennial year. The other was a retrospective of the sculptor Richard Serra. Jeff gave the exhibits only the most cursory of appraisals. He had yet to catch a glimpse of Pamela again. On the fourth floor, he saw something that made him smile despite his growing impatience. As part of the van der Rohe exhibit, the museum had installed numerous examples of the architect's furniture designs, including a Barcelona chair exactly like the one Frank Maddock had chosen for Jeff's office at Future Inc. so long ago. Still no sign of Pamela. He might have to wait two weeks before she came into the city again, trail her to another museum, or perhaps devise some kind of momentary, seemingly accidental encounter in the train station itself just long enough to look her full in the face one time, maybe to hear her say, excuse me, or it's 20 minutes to noon. Back on the third floor level of the garden hall, Jeff stopped to rest, leaned against a railing, stared out the great glass wall, and saw in the sculpture garden below the soft blonde helmet of her hair and the sky blue linen of her dress. She was still outside when he got down to the garden, she was standing with her arms crossed, looking at one of the Sarah sculptures. Jeff stopped ten feet away from her, felt a thousand conflicting emotions and memories go through his mind. Then Pamela unexpectedly turned toward him, said, What do you think of it? He hadn't prepared himself for what he might do or say if she initiated a conversation with him hadn't even thought beyond the moment of being confronted once again, however briefly, with those piercing green eyes he knew so well. No, he forcefully reminded himself, he didn't know those eyes at all. They hid a soul that had been, and forever would be, close to him. This woman in the garden would know only a single lifetime, soon to end, with no reprise, in which he played no part at all. I said, what do you think of the Sarah? As forthright as ever. It was part of her basic nature, he realized, not something that had been instilled in her by the experience of the replays. A little too abrasive for my taste, he finally answered, his thoughts on anything but the artist's work. She nodded pensively. There seems to be a sort of implied threat in most of his stuff, she said, like that one piece, Delineator Two." The one with the big steel plate flat on the floor and the other one bolted to the ceiling above it? All I could think about was what would happen if the top one tore loose and fell. Anybody standing under it would be crushed to death. He couldn't stand here and make museum small talk with her. His mind was leaping from image to image of their lives together. Her smiling from the canopy of a nearby sailplane. Her in the kitchen on Majorca her in the many beds that they had shared through the years. It was as if, through memory alone, he had created an inner replica of the video exhibit of their lives that she'd once put together as a gallery piece of her own. And that other one, she went on, the one called Circuit 2. I know the effect was supposed to be an interesting division of the room space, but all those sharp steel rectangles coming out of the corners made me feel like I was surrounded by guillotine blades. She gave an easy, self-mocking laugh. Or maybe I just got a particularly morbid imagination. I don't know. No, Jeff said, regaining his composure. I know what you mean. I felt the same way. He has a very aggressive style. Too much so, I think. It interferes with my ability to appreciate the forms on an objective level. This one looks like it might topple over any second, Jeff said. Right and in this direction, too. He laughed in spite of himself, felt a rush of the same easy self-confidence with her that he had felt when he willfully stopped his thoughts again. It would do no good to recall those other times, time spent with someone this woman only outwardly resembled. And yet, and yet, she still had the same dry wit, the same aura of warmth beneath a coolly analytical sensibility. It was a pleasure to talk to her, even though she would never have the slightest recollection 
of all they'd been through together. Listen, he said, do you want to get out from under this thing before it crashes on us and maybe have some lunch? They ate in the cafe overlooking the sculpture garden, laughed some more about the blatantly menacing nature of the Sarah pieces, bemoaned the museum's increasing reluctance to showcase newer artists. Jeff helped her on with her sweater as the shadow of the condominium tower across the museum fell across the garden. His hand brushed her hair as he did so, and it was difficult to restrain himself from caressing that familiar, long-lost face. She talked about her abandoned art career, about the frustrations and joys of raising her family. He could see the restlessness in her eyes, the gnawing sense of a life not fully lived, a life Jeff knew which would soon end. He ached to tell her of all she'd once achieved. There came a moment when the lunch was finished, the conversation at an awkward lull. So, he said, wanting to prolong the encounter, but not certain how. This has been very pleasant. Yes, it has, she agreed, fumbling uncomfortably with her coffee spoon. Do you get into the city very often? A couple of times a month. Maybe we could... His voice trailed off. He wasn't sure what he was proposing, was even less sure whether he should propose anything at all between them. Could what? She asked into the silence. I don't know. Go to another museum? Have lunch again? She fidgeted with the spoon. I'm married, you know. I know. I just... I don't... I mean, I'm not... He smiled, handed her a paper napkin. What's this for? She said, startled. For tearing into very little pieces. Pamela laughed abruptly, then stared back at him quizzically. How did you know I... She shook her head slowly from side to side. Sometimes I feel like you can read my mind. Like when you asked if I'd ever painted dolphins. I never told you how much I love whales and dolphins. I just thought you might. She ripped the napkin straight down the middle with an exaggerated flourish and looked up at him with curious merriment and an air of sudden resolve. There's a Jack Youngerman show at the Guggenheim, she said. I might come down for that next week. The musk warm scent of their lovemaking clung to him permeated the bedroom with its aromatic catalog of memories. That sweetly pungent essence brought back vivid recollections of nights beneath thick blankets at the cabin in Montgomery Creek, hot, bright days on the foredeck of a yacht off the Florida Keys, Sunday mornings wrapped in the sheets of their suite at the pier, and finally the afternoon, one year's worth of stolen afternoons here in this apartment. Jeff looked down at her face against his chest, her eyes closed, her lips parted like a sleeping child's. His mind brought forth, unbidden, the lines from the Bhagavad Gita that she'd once spoken with such passionate intensity on that long-ago evening in her Topanga Canyon retreat. You and I, Arushna, have lived many lives. I remember them all. You do not remember. Pamela stirred in his arms, uttered a wordless sound of contentment as she stretched, her body sliding against his like an affectionate kitten. What time is it? she asked, yawning. Twenty after six. Damn, she said, sitting up in bed. I have to get going. Will you be down again on Tuesday? My class was cancelled, but I haven't mentioned anything about that at home. We can spend the whole day together. Jeff smiled tried to look pleased. Next Tuesday, the whole day together, faint, bittersweet echoes of what had once been. But of course, she had no way of knowing that. Maybe I can finish the painting then, she said, slipping out of bed and gathering up her scattered clothes. When do I get to look at it? Not till it's done, you promised. He nodded feeling slightly guilty that he'd sneaked a look at the covered canvas the day before. Her talent had progressed in the year past, since she'd started painting regularly again, 
and taking graduate courses in advanced composition at NYU. But she'd never again reach the level of ability, the bold flights of imaginative brilliance she had displayed in other unremembered lives. The painting she had almost completed was a nude study of the two of them, hands joined, laughing and running through a sun-dappled tunnel of white, vine-covered trellises. Jeff was touched by its simplicity, by the naivete of the free-spirited joy it portrayed. It was a painting by an artist who had only begun to love, who had not yet had the chance to test the limits of that love, or of life itself. The time they'd spent together since that first unplanned meeting at the museum had been inescapably circumscribed. An afternoon once or twice a week here at his apartment, a rare overnight when she told her husband she wanted to stay in the city for a concert or a play, and once, only once, they'd gone away for a long weekend together to Cape Cod. She told her family she was in Boston, visiting a woman she had known in college. The possibility of divorce had been raised once, briefly, but Jeff knew she wasn't ready for such a drastic break. There were more limitations on what they could share than she would ever know, a piercing line of demarcation between the awareness of each other. Pamela seemed to sense it sometimes, vaguely, in a faraway look on Jeff's face, in a suddenly halted conversation. He loved her, genuinely loved her for the self she was today, not merely as a reflection of all those other Pamelas in other existences, and yet the constant reminder in her unknowing eyes of all that had been put behind them tinged everything they did with an unremitting melancholy. She was finished dressing and was brushing the bed tangles from her fine straight hair. How many times had he watched her do that in how many mirrors? More than she could imagine or than he could now bear to recall. See you next week, Pamela said, bending to kiss him as she scooped her purse from the nightstand. I'll try to get an early train. He returned her kiss, held her shining face between his open hands for a lingering moment thinking of the years, the decades, the hopes and plans of their lifetimes fulfilled and thwarted. But next week, they'd have all day together, a day of warmth, of early spring. It was something to look forward to. The first breath of winter blew in from off the lake, stirring the red and yellow leaves of the trees on Cherry Hill. The fountain in the concourse burbled its chill waters as Jeff and Pamela walked past it toward the graceful cast-iron sweep of Central Park's Bow Bridge. On the other side of the bridge, they wandered north along the wooded paths of the Ramble, skirting the lake to their left. Birds by the hundreds twittered excitedly all around them, getting ready for the long voyage south. Wouldn't it be nice if we could join them, Pamela said, huddling close to Jeff as they strolled. Fly away to some island or to South America. He didn't answer her, simply held her tighter, his arm protectively around her waist. But he knew with bitter certainty that he could offer no protection from what was soon to happen to them both. At the north end of the lake, they stopped on Balcony Bridge and stood gazing at the woods below the water reflecting the surrounding towers of Manhattan. Guess what? Pamela whispered, her face close to his. What? I've told Steve I'm going to visit my old roommate in Boston again next weekend, Friday through Monday. We can fly away somewhere if you want to. That's great. There was nothing he could say. It would be the height of cruelty to tell her what he knew that this was the last day they would ever see each other. This coming Tuesday, five days from now, the world would cease forever for both of them. You don't sound all that thrilled about it, she said, frowning. Jeff put on a grin, tried to mask his grief and fear, let her cling to her innocent trust in the years she assumed would be there to be lived. Now, at the end, the greatest gift he could give her was a lie. It's wonderful, 
he told her with pretended enthusiasm. I'm just surprised, that's all. We can go anywhere you'd like to go, anywhere at all. Barbados, Acapulco, the Bahamas, you name it. I don't care, she said, snuggling to him. Just as long as it's warm and quiet and I'm with you. If he spoke again, he knew, his voice would give away too much. Instead, he kissed her, willed all his heart-sick sorrow into a final, tangible expression of all that he had ever felt for her, all they'd ever... She gave a sudden moan, fell limply against him. He gripped her shoulders, kept her from collapsing to the ground. Pamela! God, no! What? She regained her footing, pulled her face back, and looked at him in shock. Jeff? Oh, Jesus! Jeff? It was there, all of it, in her widened eyes. Comprehension, recognition, memory. The accumulated knowledge and anguish of eight varied lifetimes spilled across her face, twisted her mouth with sudden confusion. She looked around her, saw the park, the New York skyline. Her eyes filled with tears, sought Jeff's again. I was, it was supposed to be over. Pamela, what year is it? How long do we have? He couldn't keep it from her. She had to know. It's 1988. She looked back at the trees, the coppery leaves drifting and swirling everywhere about them. It's already fall! He smoothed her wind-must hair, wished that he could stave off the truth for one more moment, but it would not be denied. October, he told her gently, the 13th. That's, that's only five days! Yes. It's not fair, she wept. I'd prepared myself last time. I'd almost accepted. She broke off, looked at him with new bewilderment. What are we doing here together, she asked. Why aren't I at home? I, I had to see you. You were kissing me, she said accusingly. You were kissing her, the person I used to be before. Pamela, I thought, I don't care what you thought, she snapped jerking herself away from him. You knew that that wasn't really me? How could you have done something so, so perverse as that? But it was you, he insisted. Not with all the memories, no. But it was still you. We still... I can't believe you're saying this. How long has this been happening? When did you start this? It's been almost two years. Two years? You've been using me like I was some kind of inanimate object like I it wasn't like that not at all we loved each other you started painting again went back to school I don't care what I did you seduced me away from my family you tricked me and you knew exactly what you were doing what strings to pull to influence me to to control me Pamela please he reached for her arm, trying to calm her, make her understand. You're twisting everything. You're... Don't touch me, she shouted, backing off the bridge where they'd embraced just moments before. Just leave me alone and let me die. Let us both die and get it done with. Jeff tried to stop her as she fled, but she was gone. The last hope of his last life was gone lost on the path that led to 77th Street, into the anonymous, devouring city, to death, immutable and certain death. Chapter 21 Jeff Winston died alone, yet still his dying wasn't done. He awoke in his office at WFYI, where the first of his many lives had so abruptly ended. Reporter's schedules posted on the wall, framed picture of Linda on his desk, the glass paperweight that had cracked when he had clutched his chest and dropped the phone so long ago. He looked at the digital clock on his bookshelf. 12.57 p.m., October 18th, 88. Nine minutes to live. No time to contemplate anything but the looming pain and nothingness. His hands began to shake. 
Tears welled in his eyes. Hey, Jeff, about this new campaign. Promotions director Ron Sweeney stood in his open office door, staring at him. Jesus, you look white as a sheet. What's the matter? Jeff looked back at the clock. 1.02 p.m., October 18th, 88. Get out of here, Ron. Can I get you an Alka-Seltzer or something? Want me to call a doctor? Get the hell out of here. Hey, I'm sorry, I just... Sweeney shrugged, closed the door behind him. The tremors in Jeff's hands spread to his shoulders, then to his back. He closed his eyes, bit his upper lip, and tasted blood. The phone rang. He picked it up in his shaking hand, completed the vast cycle that had begun so many lifetimes ago. Jeff, Linda said, we need... The invisible hammer slammed into his chest, killing him again. He woke again, looked in panic at the glowing red numbers across the room. 1.05 p.m., October 18th. 88. He threw the paperweight at the clock, smashed its rectangular plastic face. The phone rang and kept on ringing. Jeff blotted out the sound of it with a scream, a wordless animal bellow, and then he died, and woke with the telephone already in his hand, heard Linda's words, and died again, 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 waking and dying, awareness and void, alternating almost faster than he could perceive, centered always on the moment of that first heavy agony within his chest. Jeff's ravaged mind cried out for some release, but none was granted. It sought escape, whether in madness or oblivion no longer mattered, yet still he saw and heard and felt, remained alert to all his torment, suspended without surcease, in the awful darkness of not life, not death, the eternal, paralyzing instant of his dying. We need, he heard Linda say, to talk. There was a pain somewhere. It took him a moment to identify the source of it, his hand, rigid as a claw where he clutched the telephone. Jeff relaxed his grip, and the ache in his sweaty hand eased. Jeff, did you hear what I said? He tried to speak, could issue nothing but a guttural sound that was half moan, half grunt. I said, we need to talk, Linda repeated. We need to sit down together and have an honest discussion about our marriage. I don't know if it can be salvaged at this point, but I think it's worth trying. Jeff opened his eyes, looked at the clock on his bookshelf. 1.07 p.m., October 18th, 88. Are you going to answer me? Do you understand how important this is for us? The numbers on the clock changed silently, advanced to 108. Yes, he said, forcing the words to form. I understand. We'll talk. She let out a long, slow breath. It's overdue, but maybe there's still time. We'll see. Do you think you could get home early today? I'll try, Jeff told her, his throat dry and constricted. See you when you get here, Linda said. We'll have a lot to talk about. Jeff hung up the phone, still staring at the clock. It moved to 109. He touched his chest, felt the steady heartbeat. Alive. He was alive, and time had resumed its natural flow. Or had it ever ceased? Maybe he had suffered a heart attack, but only a mild one, just bad enough to push him over the edge into hallucination. It wasn't unheard of. He himself had made the analogy of a drowning man seeing the events of his life played back, had half expected something like that to happen when the pain first hit him. The brain was capable of prodigious feats of fantasy and time compression or expansion, particularly at a moment of apparent mortal crisis. Of course, he thought, and mopped his sweating brow with relief. That made perfect sense, much more than believing he'd actually been through all those lives, experienced all those. Jeff looked back at the phone. There was only one way to know for certain. 
feeling slightly foolish, he dialed information for Westchester County. What city, please? the operator asked. New Rochelle, a listing for Robeson, Steve, or Stephen Robeson. There was a pause, a click on the line, and then a computer synthesized voice read out the number in a dull monotone. Maybe he'd heard the man's name someplace, Jeff thought, perhaps in some minor news story. It could have gotten lodged in his mind, to be subtly woven into his delusion weeks or months later. He dialed the number the computer had given him. A young girl's voice, thick with sinus congestion, answered. Is uh, your mother home? Jeff asked the child. Just a minute. Mommy! Telephone! A woman's voice came on the line, muffled and distorted, out of breath. Hello, she said. It was hard to tell one way or the other. She was breathing in such quick, shallow gasps. Is this Pamela Robeson? Pamela Phillips? Silence. Even the breathing halted. Kimberly, the woman said. You can hang up the phone now. It's time for you to take another contact and some cough medicine. Pamela, Jeff said when the girl had put down her receiver. This is, I know. Hello, Jeff. He closed his eyes, took a deep lung full of air, and let it out slowly. It happened then? All of it? Star Sea and Montgomery Creek and Russell Hedges? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. I wasn't sure myself that it was real until I heard your voice just now. God, Jeff, I started dying over and over so fast. It was, I know, the same thing happened to me. But before that, you really do remember all the things we went through, all those lives? Every one of them. I was a doctor and an artist. You wrote books. We, we soared. That too, he heard her sigh. A long, empty sound full of regret and weariness and more. About that last day in Central Park. I thought it would be my last time. I thought that you were gone forever. I had to be with you toward the end, even if it was only a part of you that didn't really know me. She didn't say anything, and after several seconds, the silence hung between them as the lost years once had. What do we do now? Pamela finally asked. I don't know, Jeff said. I can't think straight yet. Can you? No, she admitted. I don't know what would be best for either of us right now. She paused, hesitated. You know, Kimberly's homesick from school today. That's why she answered the phone. But it's not just that she has a cold. This is the day after she got her first period. I died just as she began to become a woman, and now I understand, he told her. I've never seen her grow up, neither has her father. And Christopher, he'll just be starting high school. These years are so important for them. It's too soon for either of us to try to make definite plans right now, Jeff said. There's too much we need to absorb to come to terms with. I'm just so glad to know that I didn't imagine it all. Pamela. He struggled for the words with which to express all that he felt. If you only knew how much, I know. You don't have to say any more. He set the phone down gently, stared at it for a long time. It was possible they'd been through too much together, had seen and known and shared more than they could ever measure up to in this world gaining and losing, taking hold and letting go. Pamela had once said that they had only made things different, not better. That wasn't wholly true. Sometimes their actions had had positive results for them and the world at large. Sometimes they'd been negative. Most often they'd been neither. Each lifetime had been different as each choice is always different unpredictable in its outcome or effect. Yet those choices had to be made, Jeff thought. He'd learned to accept the potential losses in the hope that they would be outweighed by the gains. The only certain failure he knew, and the most grievous, 
would be never to risk at all. Jeff looked up and saw his own reflection in the dark smoked glass of his bookshelves. Flecks of gray in his hair, faint puffy bags beneath his eyes, thin lines beginning to crease his forehead. They'd never be smoothed out again, those marks of age. They would only deepen and proliferate new hieroglyphs of lost youth written ineradicably across his face and body with each passing year. And yet, he mused, the years themselves would all be fresh and new, an ever-changing panoply of unforeseen events and sensations that had been denied him until now. New films and plays, new technological developments, new music, Christ! How he yearned to hear a song, any song, that he had never heard before. The unfathomable cycle in which he and Pamela had been caught had proved to be a form of confinement, not release. They had let themselves be trapped in the deceptive luxury of focusing always on future options, just as Lydia Randell, in the blind hopefulness of her youth, had assumed life's choices would forever be available to her. We have so much time, Jeff heard her say. And then his own repeated words to Pamela echoed anew in his brain. Next time, next time. Now everything was different. This wasn't next time, and there would be no more of that. There was only this time, this sole finite time of whose direction and outcome Jeff knew absolutely nothing. He would not waste or take for granted a single moment of it. Jeff stood up and walked out of his office into the busy newsroom. There was a large U-shaped central desk at which Gene Collins, the midday editor, sat surrounded by computer terminals flashing the moment-by-moment -moment output of AP, UPI, and Reuters, television monitors tuned to CNN and all three networks, a communications console linked to the station's reporters in the field and their own network's correspondence in Los Angeles, Beirut, Tokyo. Jeff felt it flow through him, the electric freshness of the once more unpredictable world out there. One of the news writers hurried past, brushing a green bulletin sheet into the air booth. Something important had happened, perhaps something disastrous perhaps some discovery of surpassing wonder and benefit to humankind. Whatever it was, Jeff knew that it would be as new to him as it would be to everyone else. He'd talk to Linda tonight. Though he wasn't sure what he might say, he owed her, and himself, at least that much. He wasn't sure of anything anymore, and that realization thrilled him with anticipation. He might try again with Linda, might someday rejoin Pamela, might change careers. The only thing that mattered was that the quarter century or so he had remaining would be his life, to live out as he chose and in his own best interests. Nothing took precedence over that, not work, not friendships, not relationships with women. Those were all components of his life and valuable ones, but they did not define it or control it. That was up to him, and him alone. The possibilities, Jeff knew, were endless. Epilogue. Peter Scorgin woke, a memory of shock and excruciating pain fresh in his mind. He had been in the Bantu Republic on business, was having lunch with the deputy trade minister in Mandela City when when he had died, keeled forward right at the table, spilling his drink on the government official's trousers. He had noticed that, was embarrassed by it, even through the crushing pressure in his chest, and then the red-rimmed darkness, then nothing. Until now, here in the shop in Karl Johansgate, back home in Oslo, where he'd first learned his mercantile skills, where he'd first found his calling in the world of commerce. The shop that had been raised for an apartment block 20 years ago. Peter opened the ledger on his desk, saw the date, looked at his hands, and saw young, smooth hands, no wedding band. None of it had happened yet, 
Not the avalanche in Switzerland that had taken his son Edvard from him. Not the nights of brooding melancholy that had driven his wife Sinja into her hopeless downward spiral of alcoholism. He had no son, no wife. He had only a bright new future whose pitfalls and opportunities he knew intimately and could avoid or seize as the occasion demanded. Those years, those familiar and long past years from 1988 to 2017, were his to live again, knowing the mistakes he'd made before. This time, Peter Skorin vowed, he would do it right. And that is the end of Replay by Ken Grimwood. Please let me know what you thought about this. And I hope you enjoyed reading this book with me. I'll be back again very soon with another diamond painting video. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.